Overclocking can produce sizable increases in the clock rate of a GPU or CPU, but in laptops there's always been somewhat of a limitation on how far you can go, and that's often a thermal restriction because you've got a limited area you can cool, there's immutable cooling, you can't just throw a bigger heatsink on there, and it's also been because of the components. Now, with the new i7-6820HK, that is actually an unlocked mobile CPU, so you can overclock it through BIOS as you would normally do with any desktop CPU. There's also the GTX 970M in this thing, and more recently, the GTX 980 launched for laptops. That is a desktop part in laptops. We tested that and were able to offset the clock by about 200 megahertz, which is pretty darn big and actually does have a noticeable gain in some gaming experiences. Now, with CPU overclocking on a laptop in particular, we're looking at more than just gaming. This time, we are overclocking the 6820HK, that's the brand new unlocked CPU in here, with a 970M, and then testing to see how does that impact production workloads alongside gaming. So we test a few games, and then we're testing Photoshop, transforms, batch processing, video editing, all of these things, and those are very important for this type of laptop because a gaming laptop is often what gets deployed in production use cases in the field. So we use gaming laptops for our video and photo processing when we're covering CES. And that's what we're testing today. How does this impact the gaming and production experience with CPU and GPU overclocking? The laptop we're using for these tests is the $1,885 Fanebook 4 SK7300 CyberPower laptop. And that has for its specs an i7-6820HK processor, which is unlocked and ships stock at 2.7 gigahertz, turbos to 3.6 gigahertz and has eight megabytes of cache. The GTX 970M NVIDIA GPU is on there for the video card and that is also unlocked to some degree. You can overclock that. And the main concerns we're gonna be looking at are thermals primarily, but we're also just looking at how far can we push these things before they become unstable. We use the Witcher 3 Dirt, GTA 5, Metro Last Light, and Shadow of Mordor alongside a few other games for our benchmarks. And as always, the full methodology with a huge list of tables for our production workloads is linked in the description below if you wanna learn how we did these and see what was used for the testing. Let's start with our overclocking results and then move on to the benchmarks. This table shows the incremental testing of our overclock and shows how we achieved our final resting clock rate of 4.0 gigahertz. We attempted 4.2 and 4.1, but they were unstable and without a lot of fine tuning, it just it didn't look like it was gonna be a good fit. And so we settled on 4.0 gigahertz, which is a reasonable overclock from the 2.7 stock and 3.6 turbo. The GPU we overclocked successfully to 1172.3 megahertz, which is actually its maximum allowable overclock. It is limited to a 135 megahertz offset from base. And we ended up with a 1453.5 megahertz memory clock, which is 400 megahertz offset from base. Previously, we did this with a Dominator Pro G with a GTX 980 desktop part. So that is actually a desktop part in a laptop. And that progression is shown here if you're curious. Let's start with thermals. That is what the overclocking will most immediately impact on a laptop. The Fanebook 4's GTX 970M silicon rests at 41.3 Celsius delta T over ambient when at stock clocks, and the temperature increases marginally, 9.44% difference between the two when overclocking the GPU and CPU in conjunction. The i7-6820HK has a very slight increase in thermals, 39 Celsius to 42.82 Celsius post overclock. The CPU turbo boosts to 3.6 gigahertz when under load, and that is the case for the above chart. Here are two thermal over time charts to show additional data. The wave pattern you're seeing in the GPU one is a result of fan spin up and spin down as the GPU achieves the required heat thresholds for RPM increases, which appears to be about 45 degrees Celsius delta T on the GPU side. Now it's time to move on to the production workload benchmarks. We don't normally do these, but for a laptop like this where it might get deployed in the field and used for everyday production tasks for Photoshop and Premiere users, things like that, it is absolutely worth doing, and that's what we're looking at here. For most menial tasks, anything, for example, that requires around six seconds or fewer to complete, we saw inconsequential real-world impact from overclocking, even when the gains may be nearly 10%. The observable difference in such an instance is effectively non-existent. For example, 0.89 seconds image resize time versus 0.98 seconds is a almost 10% difference, but it's effectively imperceptible. For the more intensive actions, 
like the application of filters to large files in Photoshop, we actually did see measurable, worthwhile increases in performance. Take our Photoshop lens blur test as an easy real world example. Processing time to apply the lens blur filter shows a difference of 20.4% between the stock and overclock tests and that produces a little over 20 seconds difference in this instance. That's a huge chunk of time and for larger files or more complex filters, the 20% performance difference will be noticeable and will improve productivity of the user. For video editing, testing through PCMark, we saw a difference of 21.42%, that's the delta between the two clock rates, and this reduced render time from 146.8 seconds to 118.4 seconds averaged across three tightly consistent runs. And again, that's noticeable with large files or with frequent production. Moving on to gaming, let's look at a few FPS differences between the stock and overclocked laptops. These games are generally bound by the GTX 970M and won't show massive CPU overclock gains. To show the CPU independently really producing a difference, we would have to drop the resolution substantially or drop the quality settings. And at that point, it's no longer a real world scenario because no one's gonna do that. It's just. It, it's not worth it. GTA 5 moves from 48 FPS to 55 FPS, delta 13.6% post overclock, and whether or not that's actually visible during gameplay does remain questionable. The 13.6% delta may be noticeable in periods of severe frame drops, but generally we'd think not. Shadow of Mordor is a one FPS difference between the CPU only OC and stock clock laptop tests. There's effectively no difference here. The GPU OC generates an 11.76% delta between clock and GPU plus CPU OC configurations. But again, potentially not that noticeable even with the couple FPS gap. It's just, it's not something you're necessarily gonna pick up on as a user, especially because the 1% and 0.1% frame times are so tightly timed. Dirt Rally shows about a one FPS gain for the CPU only OC test in line with the previous benchmark. The GPU and CPU laptop OC pushes 61.7 FPS, which is a seven FPS gain over stock or delta of 12.76%. This is noteworthy because we're now exceeding 60 FPS, which to some folks is a magic number that's always in demand. This pattern persists through The Witcher 3 and Metro Last Light, and you can read more about those tests in the link in the description below. We are thoroughly impressed with the laptop as a whole and the overclocking potential of the 6820HK, which again is an unlocked Intel CPU because it's got that K signifier at the end, and the 970M. Whether or not it's worth overclocking such a laptop is the big question here. And for gaming, my answer very plainly is no. It is generally not worth overclocking. Even with the couple percent difference you see in some of these games, the actual perceptible difference is marginal. And it doesn't generate a whole lot more heat, but just because it doesn't generate a lot of heat doesn't mean that the CPU and GPU are happy. Increasing the voltage to these devices, which is what overclocking in part does, can actually damage their long-term potential. So it's not something you really want to do for a couple FPS gain. The risk to reward just isn't there. For production, however, I will say that we will be configuring OC profiles on our production gaming laptops that we take to the field because the difference of 20% in a render time is enough that we might be able to finish one more video before that next meeting. And from a production standpoint, that is big because time is money. You produce an extra video, that's more money you're making and that's just how this stuff works. So for anyone who is a production user on Premiere or Photoshop, it may be worth considering an overclock on something like a 6820HK for your on the go system. And that's something that I would do somewhat sparingly. I'd probably save it as a profile if possible and then just apply it when I'm booting up and I know I really need the extra 10 minutes at the end of my render because I'm on a tight schedule. But for the most part, if you're just gonna let it render overnight, I'd probably leave it alone because you know why burn cycles on something if you're just gonna go to sleep and it's gonna be done anyway when you wake up. So whether it's worth it or not, for gaming, no. Production, probably yes. But in sparing situations is how I would answer that. As for the review of this thing, this is not a review, so you'll find that in the near future. This is the first 970M we've worked with. If you're curious about other gaming laptops, we've worked on the 980M and 980 versions of the GT72 from MSI and CyberPower. And you can check those, of course, in the channel if you're curious. So thanks again for watching. Hit the Patreon link in the post-roll video. Hit the link in the description below for more information. And I will see you all next time.